I would describe it as circuitous. Um, I wrote a lot when I was young. Um, I was the editor of the creative writing journal at my high school, but I never really imagined it as a career path. And so when I went to college, um, not only did I not study creative writing, um, I barely took any literature classes. I studied political science, I studied the politics of South Asia, meaning India and Pakistan, as an undergraduate, and Northeast Asia, meaning China and Japan and Korea, um, as a graduate student. Um, and it really wasn't until uh, my 30th birthday when my youngest child was going into the first grade and I, for the first time, could look at a day where I had a chunk of time to myself. Um, asked myself the obvious qu question to which there has never been an answer of just what job I thought I would get with a degree in these, um, these area studies that I had done, these political theory studies that I had done, and decided that what I really wanted was to be a writer. Um, the first thing I did, because as I said, I, you know, I had no particular background in these things, um, was to join a public workshop in Davis, California, where I lived, which just met once a week. It was a number of people who'd made the same insane decision that I had just made, that they wanted to be writers, and there was no instructor. We just got together and we read to each other what we had written um, over the week. And I remained in that workshop for more than 30 years. Uh, eventually, we moved away from Davis to Santa Cruz, and. I was forced to leave the workshop behind, but um, it was in that process. Um, not so much of other people reading my work and more to my surprise of me reading their work and thinking very hard about it and trying to talk to them about what I thought worked and what didn't work when my own ego was not involved, where I feel I got my background as a writer. Well, obviously, I have to say no, <laughs> since I did uh, neither of those. I think that one of the wonderful things about being a writer is that any knowledge you have, any experience you have, whatever you did with your summer vacations, um, whatever hobbies fascinate you, it's all material that you can use. And that the more you bring in from other areas that are not so focused on writing, the more unusual and interesting your work is likely to be. So um, it's possible that I'm merely defending my own decisions, but not only would I say that you don't have to do those things, I wouldn't recommend them. Yeah, this is a painful question for me because I so wish to be a good role model, and I so I'm not. I, I really believe with all my heart what many other writers have told me, which is that a real writer works every day, um, sits down at the computer at about the same time every morning. A wonderful writer I took a class from named Carolyn Forche said to us, uh, don't expect the muse to track you down at the grocery store. If you're not at your desk, she's going to go look for someone who is. All of which I, I completely believe and none of which I have ever achieved. I work in spurts. If, um, if a project is going well, then I do work every day, then I work for long hours every day, but I go months without working at all. I do do a great deal of research. Um, some of my books have been historical novels, and so the research is very evident, but um, some of them, my most recent book, uh, involved animal cognition and um, and I, I, I did as much research um, on those subjects as I've ever done. Usually I do research for about a year before I start writing. And often during that period, uh, I don't really know what my book is going to be. One of the things I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the time and place that the book will be set in. I'm trying to figure out the things I will need to know to tell the story. but. Uh, often I'm looking for the story, too. I'm, I'm reading texts and looking for characters that are interesting to me and events that I think I might use. And 
um, I do not wish ever to be admired for the research I do because it's my favorite part. If I lived in a perfect world, I would just do the research and never write the book. I'm much more productive if I have ret retreat time, which means I'm taken out of my real world and put someplace where I don't have to think about what we might have for dinner or you know whether the laundry needs to be hung out. Um, so that a, 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 when I'm in one of these protected zones, it may not even be the case that I'm, that I'm sitting at the computer for longer than I would at home. What is the case is that when I get up from the computer, I am still in the world of my story. And when I'm at home, I'm not. When I'm at home, there are errands to do and people to talk to and things that take me out of it. So um, what I'm always looking for is the experience where, uh, where I can't make that division, where I'm just living in my story all day long. My children, when they were young, figured out that if things were going well, I was very likely um, living in another time and another place and with other people and that it was a good time to ask me if they could do things or have things. And I would hear them saying to each other, she said yes, and I would think, oh, what, what, what did I say yes to? What have, what have I done? My younger writing self was terribly afraid of failing at things and uh, if I could I would tell that younger writing self that failure is not something to be avoided, that it's an inevitable part of the process, that nobody writes well, not when they begin their writing career and also not when they begin each project. Each project involves a period of writing very badly and that um, it's nothing to be afraid of, that it's, it's in fact something to be embraced and to enjoy, just to, to acknowledge it and tell yourself you'll fix it later. I've done a lot of teaching and I've been in a lot of workshops and so I've seen a lot of people who really wanted to be writers fail in a variety of ways. Um, but there are three that are by far the most common, so these are the three traps I would look for. The first one, by far, by far the most common way somebody who wishes to be a writer fails to be a writer is by not writing. It's um, astonishing how many people join workshops and go to classes but don't actually write anything, uh, although it, it must be clear that that really is an essential step. Um, the second one is to not finish anything that they're writing. I've, I've seen a number of people who approach a new project with enormous enthusiasm and um, uh, you know, a, a great deal of uh, energy only to see it all dissipate before they've come to the end of it and to put it aside and start something new where there's energy again. Um, and the third one is um, that you do write and you do finish what you write, but you don't send it out to, um, to be looked at and uh, to be possibly published. Or you send it out once or twice and people say no and you think, well, that's that. Obviously, it's not going to work. My first novel, which eventually went on to win the uh, uh, Commonwealth Medal for the best first novel by a Californian that year, was rejected 23 times before anyone would buy it and publish it. So again, not only is failure part of what you've agreed to do when you become a writer, but um, rejection is something you have agreed to survive as well. I don't, um, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer this question. I have a uh, a book that I got when I was having children with baby names in it that I refer to. I, I generally have a sense of um, that I want a character to have a really common name or a really uncommon name and based just on that very simple distinction I go through my baby book and I pick out a name I like.
I don't have a favorite genre. I like them all. Um, I, I think there are writers working in every genre that I think are f fabulous and that I read with great enthusiasm. I, I probably read less romance than any other genre, but I love Jennifer Cruzy and I love Georgette Heyer. Um, in science fiction, I love Kelly Link and Ted Chang and Ursula Le Guin. In mysteries, I love Josephine Tay and Elizabeth George um, and Benjamin Black. Um, for mainstream, I love Dave Eggers. I love um, Jonathan Lethem. I love Barbara Kingsolver. I, I, I think I probably have misremembered this, but it's been a useful misremembering, if so, that, um, that the library in Bloomington, Indiana, which was my library when I grew up, did not sort books by genre, that, that it was a shock when we moved to California to see on the spines of the books there'd be a little cowboy boot if it was a western or a little spaceship if it was science fiction. I don't think that, that my library did that, and I think as a result I just don't care. Um, what genre it is. I just like books and I like stories and I like good writing and that is found in every genre uh, there is. I think the book I read um, most recently has not been published yet is by a man named Andrew Sean Greer and it's called Less. And, um, I am highly recommending it. It's, uh, I'm just about to start reading a nonfiction book by David Talbot called The Devil's Chessboard, which is about the Kennedy assassination. Promises to answer all questions. So I've had those questions since I was 13 years old. I'm looking forward to having them answered. I loved uh, The Once of Future King by T.H. White. And again, I think this was um, a really useful book to have loved for somebody who is going to grow up to be a writer. Because when I did take workshops um, and brought my work in and had people respond to it, uh, I was frequently told there were all these rules that I knew nothing about. I'd never taken creative writing. I would be told, um, you know, that you, that you can't switch tone from terribly tragic to, to comic, that, uh, that you can't, if you're writing a historical novel, you can't use anachronisms that pull the reader out of the story, that, you know, that you, that you must settle on a genre and stick to it. Um, and I was always quite impervious to all those rules because T.H. White pays no attention to any of them. So I would sit and be told that I couldn't do what I wanted to do and what I was doing, and I would think, no. I know I can, because T.H. White does. I don't think that my process has really changed. I think that, um, that there's, a, uh, there's a great freedom before you've published in thinking that nobody is ever actually going to read what you write, so you're free to do whatever you want and say whatever you want and, um, and not worry about how it may be judged and how it may be received. So um, now that I think I probably will sell a book and, uh, and someone may in fact read it and review it, I spend some time each day really on a, on a daily basis when I work trying to put myself back in that place where I felt that freedom as I, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be self-conscious. I don't want to worry that I'm going to do something that people will dislike or find, you know, too, too disturbing. I, I always want to start in that place where I think nobody is ever going to read this so I can do whatever I want. That's an excellent question and one that um, that I have spent some time talking to other writers about. So I know that I am not alone in, um, in my feeling that somehow I have um, perpetrated an enormous scam 
and that I'm about to be exposed at any moment, that with my next book, people will understand that I did not deserve those reviews and that acclaim. Um, there, I think writing is a, is a place where the imposter syndrome flourishes, and that there are very few writers that I know who don't feel that they're about to be unmasked at any moment for the frauds that they are. At the risk of stating the obvious, uh, you should go to the library. I think we, we talked earlier about genres, and I think that it has been enormously valuable to me that I read anything and everything, and that's the main thing I would recommend, that, that um, it's really critical that you read, it's really critical that you read a lot, and it's really critical that you read in parts of the library or parts of the bookstore that you don't normally go into. That you should, you should take yourself into a whole nother part of the stacks and pull out a book that um, does not interest you at all and read it and see if it's not more interesting than you think it is. I, my very first novel I got the idea for by being in the library at UC Davis and pulling a book off the shelves, which was The History of Tacoma, Washington. It was three volumes, and I think I looked at it and I thought, who could possibly have three volumes worth of information about Tacoma, Washington? This will be a very dull book. Um, but I, I chose it for that reason, that I thought it would be dull, which of course it was not, because books are not. <laughs>